Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. Now, I was going to do a story on bullion scams, and hopefully I can get to that. But this story was breaking just as I started this update. The head of Mt. Gox has been arrested. That's Mark Carpellis. We're going to read some of the story, and then we're going to dig deeper into this because this rabbit hole goes a lot deeper than you would initially think. So let's uh, get to the story here. Back in its 2013 heyday when Bitcoin soared from below $100 to over $1,000. Now let me show you that chart. This is the rally here. Unbelievable rally. You can see that. 85 bucks to 1163 And we're going to get at some... Uh, hints that perhaps Carpellis was actually behind this run. I don't believe that, but that's definitely hinted at. Uh, Magic the Gathering, uh, I think you guys know that it was an exchange for Magic the Gathering cards, but uh, it was called Mt. Gox, so that's the reasoning. Uh, there was only one real Bitcoin exchange, Magic the Gathering Online Exchange, or Mt. Gox, as it was better known which had become the world's largest hub for trading the digital currency. And then, as mysteriously as it had appeared, Mt. Gox went dark and filed for bankruptcy after nearly half a billion dollars worth of Bitcoins disappeared. Now, I actually did a video. It was linked on Wikipedia. I don't think it's linked there anymore, but I caught the first Bitcoin crash where Bitcoin went to one penny. That was when they were hacked the first time. And basically, there were nothing but sell orders. Uh, it's still a popular video. I think it's got like 100,000 views. And it's a live... Uh, I'll, I'll link it in the, the uh, notes. Uh, but that was the first hack. Then this is the second hack. And uh, Zero Hedge says, We wrote at the time for a case study of a blistering rise and an absolutely epic fall of an exchange that I was named after Magic the Gathering... Oh, two, I'm sorry. Transacted in a digital currency, which many have speculated was conceived by the NSA nearly two decades ago and was used as a honeypot to trap the gullible. Look no further than Mt. Gox, which after halting withdrawals for the second and final time has finally done the honorable thing and filed for bankruptcy. As the Wall Street Journal reports, Bitcoin exchange Mt. Gox said Friday it was filing for bankruptcy protection after losing almost 750,000 of its customers' bitcoins, marking the collapse of a marketplace that once dominated trading in the virtual currency. The company said it also lost around 100,000 of its own bitcoins, and it goes on. In other words, oops, sorry, several hundred million in bitcoin is unaccounted for, but blame the system weakness. This promptly led to various artistic interpretations of the Mt. Gox logo. Some were confused if Carpellis was going to get away with nothing more than an excuse, even if, as many have speculated, he had personally fabricated exchange data entries and embezzled millions of dollars for his own account. As a reminder, when it filed for bankruptcy in, Feb in February 2014, Mt. Gox said 750000 customer bitcoins and another 100000 belonging to the exchange were stolen due to a software security flaw. The lost funds represented the equivalent of $480 million at the time of the bankruptcy filing. Mt. Gox also said more than $27 million was missing from its Japanese bank accounts. Carpellas, who had blamed hackers for the loss, later said he had recovered 200000 of the lost bitcoins. Earlier today, we got the answer when nearly 18 months after his infamous apology, Mark Carpellas was arrested in Tokyo. FT reports that Japanese police have arrested Mark Carpellis, the head of the bankrupt Japan-based Bitcoin exchange Mt. Gox. The arrest charge is that he made an illegal entry to the system in February 2013 and increased the balance of his account by $1 million. And yet, a year and a half after the exchange insolvency, nobody truly knows what happened. The alleged crimes involved are hard to pin down, say police sources, because of the absence of specific laws governing the virtual currency. Police have acknowledged privately that their technical elements of the alleged disappearance of nearly $500 million that still are not properly understood. Asked by Mt. Gox to look into the matter in March last year, the Tokyo Metropolitan Police were not able to begin 
their investigation until three months later. Even then, say people close to the investigation, the two police departments in charge, the Symer Crime Unit and the White Collar Crime Unit did not properly share information. The year-long investigation, say legal experts, has culminated in an arrest that will allow police to hold Mr. Carpellis without charge for 23 days. If he continues to deny any wrong during, during that time, police may alter the charge and hold him for another 23 days. While Carpellis may very well be guilty of embezzlement and massive fraud against his clients, could it be the still undetermined crimes relating to a virtual currency will become just the excuse to keep unsavory suspects detained and or under arrest for an indefinite period of time? Because being held for up to 46 days without any charge, etc. As FT adds, the case has exposed both the complexities of crime relating to the Bitcoin virtual currency and the profound difficulties encountered by the Japanese police as they have attempted to investigate Mt. Gox. And it goes on. And there's Carpellis being hauled away. Now, this story gets a lot more bizarre. There is a Reddit thread called I'm Ashley Barr, a.k.a. Adam Turner, the first Mt. Gox employee and alleged DPR. And I'll read the first part of this. To get this whole thing, you really have to go through this entire subreddit, and it's huge. But there's some very good questions asked, and there's some very good answers. I was hired by Mark in June of 2011 to help him handle the crazy inbox at Mt. Gox during Bitcoin's initial rally. In January of 2012, I was asked to become Mt. Gox's CEO, a process which led to my dismissal in May 2012. My statement along with other ex-employees have led the Tokyo Metro Police's arrest on embezzlement and illegal manipulation of accounting. We plan to eat pizza in front of Mark while he is in prison. Ask me anything. Edit. I haven't logged into this account since I left Mount Gox. I have left I have a lot of hate mail between now and then. Sorry to all those people who have reached out. I've had no chance to respond to. I feel and echo your frustrations. So this is the former CEO, Ashley Barr, also known as Adam Turner, which is this moniker, Mount Gox Adam. Now, she goes into this, and I'm not going to go into all of this. You'll have to read it for yourself. There's a lot here, and there's some very important stuff. Uh, basically, she accuses Mark of just goofing around. Um, well, actually, I need to read a little bit of this. Uh, so she was brought on as CEO, and uh, she was dismissed. And here's the story. Basically, after Mark asked me to be CEO, I tried my best at due diligence. I asked Mark to show me the financials of the company. He wouldn't or feigned that he would do it later, all the while pressuring me to take the role. Mt. Gox's trading history was public. The fee structure wasn't, however. So me and a couple of employees calculated on an average what Mt. Gox's profits would have been. We then looked at the expenses, eyewitness expenses only a.k.a. we collaborated and made a list of things we'd seen purchased for the company. So it's not accurate, but surely less than what was actually spent, and used the trading data to collect some averages of Mt. Gox's profits. The expenditures far exceeded every model we had for income. Now, we're going to visit this same scenario later when we look at these bullion scams, but this is... A situation that happens a lot where someone runs a business and begins to eat through the seed corn of the business the the customer funds because the business is not profitable she says I confronted Mark about it told him I couldn't take the role if he couldn't explain this gross incompetence in spending he was also asking employees other than myself to find investors something impossible without knowing the financial status of the company Around the same time, we learned that Mark only had one bank account shared with Mt. Gox's customer deposit. So that is the absolute nail in the coffin right there. He was actually intermingling customer deposits with his own money. There, there's a place in Shibuya, and that's her 
thing about a, a bar. So I encourage you, I strongly encourage you to read this entire subreddit. I don't know, I'll have to uh, mirror it or something. I don't know how long it's going to stay up. But this story actually goes much, much deeper than this. And I got the the lead on this story from a commenter who was on this thread who said, this is no coincidence because of the post made recently by Mark on his page. This is MagicalTux.net and this is a post. There he is, Mark Carpalis. And this is what he says. Now, I'm going to go to another story before I show you that because you need to understand what's going on with the Silk Road. Now, uh, Dread Pirate Robert, and we don't know who the person is. We don't know if the correct person was arrested. We don't know anything. But supposedly the person who, who ran the Silk Road. The Silk Road was an online exchange where you could exchange anything for Bitcoin. And I mean anything. That could be drugs. That could be child pornography. That could be uh, putting out hits on people. Everything illegal, you could buy it with Bitcoin. It was called the Silk Road, and it was run by this person known as Dread Pirate Roberts, who was arrested in a DEA sting because, of course, the majority of the money was uh, purchases of drugs using Bitcoin. Now, for the life of me, uh, I never, I've never even been on the site. I never even went on the site because ever since I got into Bitcoin, I never wanted to have anything to do with anything illegal because I knew it would be the downfall of it. And it was a good idea, but linked with these things, it would be brought down. And that turned out to be correct. But this website allowed you to buy and sell drugs, and I couldn't understand how you could possibly buy and sell drugs when if you send somebody some bitcoins, then you have to give an address for them to send the drugs to. So obviously, if the person selling you the drugs is a drug enforcement agent, then they know your address and they come and arrest you. So I have never been able to figure out how this model even worked in the first place. But putting that aside, the way that the Silk Road was shut down and that Dread Pirate Roberts was arrested was through these two DEA agents who led this case and they were corrupt. Uh, just the first of this year, uh, of, of July of this year, uh, the agent pled guilty to extorting Bitcoin from Ross Ulbrich. That's Dread Pirate Roberts. And I'll read a little bit of this. A former DEA agent pleaded guilty Wednesday to money laundering, obstruction of justice, and extortion for his actions during the two years he spent investigating the online drug marketplace Silk Road as an undercover agent. Carl Mark Force the Fourth, 46, served on the Baltimore, etc. Baltimore, interesting. So let's look at what he did. Over the course of a 16-page plea deal, Force admits to a long list of corrupt actions during his time investigating the Silk Road, acting as knob. Force offered Ulbricht fake driver's licenses and inside information about Silk Road investigation in the exchange for 925 Bitcoin worth approximately $100,000. Instead of turning that money over to the government, Force transferred it to a personal bank account and attempted to hide the fact that he had ever received the money from Ulbricht. Using a second unsanctioned persona, French Maid, Force says he received another $100,000 in Bitcoin from Ulbricht in exchange for information about the Silk Road investigation. Additionally, Force admits to investing $110,000 in Bitcoin in Coin MKT while serving as the Digital Exchange's Chief Compliance Officer. So get this, an undercover DEA agent is acting as a Chief Compliance Officer for a digital exchange without DEA approval. Was it or was it not? In February 2014, Force was alerted to potential fraud in an account holding $337, Force told Coin MKT to freeze the account and then transferred $300,000 to his personal bank account, altering reports to show that only the remaining $37,000 had been seized from the account. And it goes on. So you get the picture. The people who busted 
Dread Pirate Roberts or Ross Ulbricht were criminals themselves. Now, the way that this gets interesting is that this post from Mark Carpellis that is dated the 14th of July uh, goes over this. You can see, I'm going to read a little bit of it. I'm still investigating the elements made available with the arrest of Sean Bridges and Carl Mark Force, but at this point I already know some interesting facts. We know that both agents have been investigating Silk Road since at least 2012 based on news reports and it goes on. I'm not going to read all of this, but Mark is speculating as to the corruption of these gov U.S. government agents that have now been uh, indicted and uh, uh, convicted, pled guilty to these crimes. But I want to—I I don't have time to go over all this, but I want to get down to uh, one of these comments that Carpellis makes, and it's very, very interesting. Um, he says here, this is the end of his statement from July 14th. So he, he was arrested two weeks after he posted this. Of course, some could argue that this was actually an attempt by the U.S. government to act against Bitcoin. But while the possibility exists at this time, I have nothing supporting this scenario. I also recently learned that SR1 vendors discussed various ways to harm Mt. Gox, including freak signatures, and that it was about stealing Bitcoins. So, you draw your own conclusions. I am going to say that I side with Mark Carpellis on this. I think that he was just a very, very naive person who came in and got involved with Bitcoin at a time when it just happened to explode. Um, it's very interesting that we're looking at Bitcoin Wisdom's price. You can see up here that we have Bitstamp, BTC E, Bitfinex. There's even the Chinese exchange Huobi. You see they have all these. Well, none of these exchanges existed at this time when these prices were, were registered. So you're actually looking at a high that came from Mt. Gox. None of these exchanges existed. So the thing has spread out now, and that's good. But again, the big risk is putting your money on deposit with someone else. In other words, if you don't hold it, you don't own it. And I'm going to use that. I, I would love to spend a lot more time on that but I don't have time. But I'm going to use that as a segue into this story with Bullion Direct. Now, if you're not familiar with About AG, you need to get familiar with that site. That is a fantastic site. This is the guy who single-handedly uh, followed every breaking story with the uh, bankruptcy of Tolving. And you're going to see here that it is, it's absolutely astounding how many uh, companies have been involved in this thing. Um, I thought I had it here. Yeah, that's the one. So let's look at Bullion Direct to start with, because this is the big one that's in the news lately. But we're going to find out here that it's not at all an exception. In fact, when we get to this list, it's going to seem like it's the rule. So... We all know about Bullion Direct. They shut down, and you can go to About AG. And what I did was I went to uh, About AG, and he actually, um, if you go to this link to older news, you can actually see that he was documenting the pattern. And this is actually a similar pattern that we saw in Mt. Gox. People withdrawing their bitcoins or their dollars from the exchange we're starting to see delays. And it, you can see here that uh, it started off with Better Business Bureau complaints. And then he explains his role. And for the people that uh, can't get their silver, you've got a, B, a Better Business Bureau rating going down to F. You've got the complaints. This is the pattern. Uh, they moved the corporate structure to Delaware Company. Uh, you had uh, funds 
frozen. Uh, then he says, time to sound the alarms. And he actually does it himself. And then you have the official declaration here. Chapter 11, bankruptcy filed. So Bullion Direct, apparently, now I don't know the facts on this. I haven't spent the time to investigate it. But Bullion Direct apparently was not purchasing all the bullion that they uh, that they said they had. And don't quote me on that because I don't know if that's true. That'll all be sorted out in the courts. But it's very interesting to me to go to a link that he links on here about the people that have done this in the past. You are going to be shocked. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time so you can see the pattern here. But it is absolutely shocking. He gives a link here on this story to the bankruptcies and filings of these other bullion scams. And they are unbelievable. Bullion bankruptcy, fraud, government actions, etc. Here we have put together a list of bankruptcies, government actions, cease and desists, frauds, scams, etc. by bullion dealers. There are plenty of legitimate dealers out there and plenty of warning signs of bad dealers. The companies listed here are ones that have filed for bankruptcy, had lawsuits filed against them, other regulatory action, or the like. They may not meet the legal definition of fraud, but in most cases, most customers would feel they were defrauded, with a few hopefully obvious exceptions. If the company is still in business, it may well be legitimate. Just to be sure, to be aware of any actions taken against them before doing business with them, use your own common sense. For example, sending $1,000 for metal to be shipped within a week from a company with few Better Business Bureau complaints is much safer than sending $10,000 to a company for $40,000 of metal that they claim to store for you. Note that many statements are alleged, typically in court documents, so all statements here should be taken as alleged. Also, the law is very complex and it can be very difficult at times to find out the reality of situations, e.g. if someone sent sentenced does end up in jail if a conviction is overturned, etc. Part of the goal of this page is to show the widespread nature of the issues with the unregulated bullion business, as well as put together a database of names, as many are repeat offenders or related to offenders. We may also put together dossiers of, for a nominal fee with detailed information about companies. Now here's the list. I'm just going to show you the list before I start reading here. This is the list. It's startling. And what's also startling to me, now now Hunter Wise, this is going to be one that comes up many, many times. This is one that was connected to a bunch of them that was doing a kind of margined uh, storage scam. But what's so shocking to me is the number of them that were basically doing a kind of uh, uh, leveraged play where you could put down a certain amount of money like he says here. Uh, I would, I'd never even thought of the thing before until I saw this. Sending $10,000 to a company for $40,000 of metal that they store for you. That's very strange right there. So that's obviously a leveraged play. Uh, so let's look at some of these here. And we know about Tolving. Trading Company, Inc., uh, Laguna, Niguel, California, used Hunter Wise. They started selling commodities options, then selling leveraged metal. 63% of the money went to commissions. Half of the customers used IRA funds. The court froze their assets. AJPM, Portland, Oregon, a well-known precious metal dealer. After the collapse of Blue, Coin, Blue Moon Coins, Blue Moon Coins was owned by Aaron uh, a cease and desist order was given. So I'm going to try to give you the most egregious ones. Here's Amerifirst Management, claimed to be a precious metals wholesaler and clearing firm, had about 30 dealers whose customers would put down about 20% accused of not buying the metal or making loans. American Bullion Exchange, advertised on TV and employees required to make a minimum of 350 prospecting calls per day 
Investors were told funds were only for bullion and coins and segregated accounts insured with the stop loss to protect them. Instead, they bought futures and options, accused of misappropriating $1.4 million for their benefit, akin to a Ponzi scheme. American Capital Partners, Ghana, we're not going to go into that. American Gold Alliance. American Precious Metals LLC, charged with fraud by the CFTC, charged commissions of about 40% of the initial investment for financed stored metal. Atlantic Bullion and Coin Company, media reports say it appeared to be a $70 million Ponzi scheme. The owner was sentenced to 19.5 years in prison, Ronnie Jean Wilson. This is in 2012. Did you hear about that? I didn't. Auburn Precious Metals. The business was raided in 1989 as a part of the largest drug bust in the county at the time. The owner was accused of knowingly laundering up to $1 million in drug money by taking cash payments and structuring them into non-reportable. Interesting. What does that have to do with Precious Metals? There's another Hunter Wise, another Hunter Wise. Blue Moon Coins, they sell physical metal. Complaints were filed that Blue Moon Coins was taking over 28 days to ship. There's a big red flag. Several government investigations were opened. Some funds were reportedly diverted to affordable precious metals. And it goes on. I don't have time to read all these. You need to read all of these. I had no idea. This is a gigantic list. And there's a very large number of people who are buying precious metals to be stored by the company. And they're not buying the precious metals. It's just like the scam with Bitcoin. He was mingling the money in the Bitcoin accounts with his own money. And it's questionable whether the Bitcoins existed. Both of these stories point to the exact same thing whether it's a Bitcoin scam or whether it's a bullion scam. And actually, they're, they're very close to being equivalent. You can, you can actually store your Bitcoin in a safe location, uh, similar to how you can store your bullion. But you have to store it yourself. You can't have someone else store it. Now, I know there are a lot of legitimate businesses out there. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I think Atmex has one, but I know there's Andy Hoffman and Miles Franklin. We've got James Turk, we've got other people, but apparently there's a very, very large number who claim to be storing bullion for people who never purchased the bullion. So there is a much larger number of bullion scams out there than I'd ever imagined uh, could be possible. You can see, go through the list yourself. It's very, very clear that the only way you can be safe with the precious metals is to buy physical metals from the most reputable reputable dealer that you can find. And I've listed those for you. For me, these are people I've done business with. Uh, first of all, the most I've purchased from is Atmex. The second definitely is Gainesville. The third is, well, it'll be a tie between third and fourth, is going to be JM Bullion and uh, Provident Metals. Those four are the only four, except for some exceptions, many, many years ago, say in 2003 when I was buying Eagles for five bucks and stuff like that. But beside that, it has been those four ones and they ship as soon as, I mean, they ship in days and I have a tracking number from UPS and I get my coins. So this is a very serious thing. Now, the last point here, that I think is very important and it's hinted at in the Bitcoin story. It's also hinted at in the silver story. When we look at some of the threads that are running through these is Mark Carpellis has alleged that this whole thing, including possibly Silk Road and Ulbricht himself was an attempt to discredit Bitcoin. And I'm going to suggest to you that there is at least a possibility that uh, and I did some real rabbit hole digging on these guys. Some of these guys here, some of them were white supremacists. We we got over to the Southern Love uh, 
uh, Southern Poverty Law Center site and some really strange stuff if you dig really deeply and follow these rabbit trails. So there is a possibility that I'm starting to suspect that some of this is actually government agents that are doing this to try to discredit the precious metals. Of course, um, this has nothing to do with the precious metals, just as Mt. Gox has nothing to do with Bitcoin. These are legitimate investments, but they're trying to besmirch them with shady deals all around them. That is possible. That is what I'm surmising when I dig into this. I challenge you to dig into it yourself and uh, see if that's where the rabbit trail leads uh, on this bullion scam. And we'll talk to you next time.